Good evening, Roberts and Jenis here for the Open Question Program for October the 8th, 2019, Tuesday. Uh, this program, as I have done for the past several months, is set aside for you to bring your questions or comments, your prostidigitations, whatever you want to bring to the open question program, I, as your host, will comment on the things you have to say and the questions you bring and try my best to give you an answer from our Catholic faith, from the Bible, from our tradition. So, um, <clears throat> as usual, there were a lot of questions I didn't get to last week, uh, last Wednesday, and um, that um, seems to be happening with more rapidity as we um, gain more followers and take in more questions. So um, I'm going to try to answer the questions a little bit more quickly so that um, if there are questions you want to ask, you don't get cut off, so to speak and we can you know accommodate you if you come in a little later um just as much as we accommodate the people who come in first so um without further ado let me get to the questions for tonight that are accumulating on the on the board so um ben is back again tonight Hi, Ben. Thank you for your wonderful letter, by the way. I appreciate your comments concerning... Oh, by the way, that brings up something that I wanted to say before we get into the program. Um, this is one of my major projects, as you can see here. Uh, it's called an exegetical commentary of the Douay Reims New Testament from the original Greek. Uh, my name at the bottom there, okay. So what this is, is it takes the 1899 Douay Reims Bible that was originally published in 1609 and had gone through some revisions, uh, especially by uh, Bishop Chandler, and that's what the 1899 Dewey Reams ended up to be, his um, corrections to the, and updates, really, because the original Dewey Reams was written in Old English. Uh, if you've ever <laughs> tried to read Old English, uh, it's a little hard because um, sometimes they spell words differently. They had different, um, different letters for the same letter, like some of their Fs. Their Ss look like Fs and things like that, just like in Latin sometimes. Um, so um, that is, um, I've been working on this for a very long time. Let me try to make it go back, there we go working on this for a very long time and um and what it is is all the 27 books of the new testament i exegete them from the original greek and it's a verse by verse exegesis and sometimes even one verse has about it could have four four or five footnotes on it and sometimes those footnotes get rather lengthy because the verse is complicated. So, um, <clears throat> uh, it, it's a very detailed, comprehensive work. There's nothing out there like it on the market. I have never seen one. The closest one I've seen comes from uh, Cornelius Lapide back in the 1600s. And, um, but even he, he basically just does uh, etymological analysis on Greek words. He does not get into the grammar of the Greek. And uh, so <clears throat> that's a vital component. 
that Catholics have been missing for quite a long time. And I felt, you know, somebody ought to do that because, you know, this book, and, you know, I might want to pat myself on the back here, but I'm just saying there's nothing like it on the market. And this, this kind of book is exactly what today's Catholic seminarians need and Catholic professors in universities and colleges. Okay, because this takes, this uses um, traditional, um, historical, grammatical exegesis of the Bible, okay, and uh, makes it uh, readable. And the reason the Greek is important is because you can get so much more out of the Greek than you can the English. And that's why there's so many different English translations. Um, you know, when I was writing my book, um, was it last year, Flat Earth, Flat Wrong, um, I went through 45 different New Testament translations. I mean, uh, not New Testament, um, Bible translations of Old and New Testament, 45 different ones to just for one verse. And it was amazing the disparity between those translations. Why is that? Well, because not everyone understands the original Greek or even the original Hebrew. It takes a lot of study and um, sometimes you come out on the wrong end of the stick and the translation will be wrong or sometimes it'll be close but not close enough and the reader, you know, the studious reader should know that. She should, should know the differences at least. Not to say that I'm going to hit on every exact interpretation that, you know, the, the writers of the New Testament meant. I'm just saying that this book will give you at least what the parameters are, what the differences are. And so you can see that. And sometimes those differences can be pretty impactful. Uh, not only theologically, but morally and personally with your relationship with God. So um, just wanted to advertise this. Uh, I'm trying to raise funds for this because this takes a lot of work. I spend, um, outside of my other work, okay, that you've seen me do, you know, like the book, other books that I've advertised and uh, like, on the geocentric issue, I've been writing about that like crazy for the past 16 years. That's come to an end. I won't be writing any more books on that. So <clears throat> I am spending all my time on this book, probably about 10 hours per day. It's very time consuming. It's very energy consuming. And um, <clears throat> I need your help. I need your support to help me do this. So uh, it'll be well worth it when it's all done. You can turn to any passage in the New Testament, any verse, and you'll be able to see what the interpretation should be from the Catholic perspective. It will give some of the Protestant interpretations and why they're wrong, and any other, you know, Jewish or Orthodox interpretations and why they're wrong. And uh, it'll also give some critiques of, you know, historical criticism and all those things that are, is being taught in our modern Catholic seminaries. They don't do exegesis. Let me put this down. I'm tired of holding it up. Um, <clears throat> they don't do exegesis from the grammatical historical perspective anymore. Uh, it's all liberal, you know, trying their best to tell you why uh, the verse isn't uh, inspired by God and what the author uh, meant because he was writing it from his own mind, you see. That's what they try to do today. Instead of taking the Bible as the Word of God, um, you know, they spend more time trying to convince you that it isn't the Word of God than that it is the Word of God. And, um, you know, one of the Bibles we have today uh, that's pretty popular in seminaries, Catholic seminaries, is the, um, the New Jerome uh, Study Bible uh, with editor uh, Raymond Brown. Father Raymond Brown died, what, 
gosh, I think it was in the 90s he died, or late 90s. And Fitz, uh, Fritz Meyer, who used to teach at Catholic University of America, and Roland Murray, I think his name is. Anyway, they had two versions of it. They had the first Jerome biblical commentary in the 70s, and then they redid it into the new one. But, you know, right in that commentary, uh, uh, Father Brown says that, you know, Scripture basically is not inspired unless it's talking about salvation. And so that, he believes, gives him the right and his colleagues uh, to go in and basically uh, rip the Bible apart uh, piece by piece unless perhaps the Bible's talking about salvation and even then uh, they are the judges of when the Bible is talking about salvation because according to them it would have to do so directly. Okay, so um, <laughs> that's been in Catholic seminaries all over the world now uh, for decades and uh, they look at me as a dinosaur. Uh, you know, I, I don't join the, the clubs and the guilds and the societies uh, that um, are centered around the Bible in Catholicism because to me they're not worth the time of day because of what they've done to the Bible. And that's a whole, whole sermon I could give on what Catholicism has done to the Bible in, mo in the modern age that would just make your hair stand on end. You wouldn't believe it. And, uh, you know, those kinds of things, uh, you know, they shouldn't be. Uh, the Bible is all the Word of God. It's all inspired. It's all inerrant. And it has to be treated that way, each and every verse. And that's what I do in this Bible commentary, the way the old Catholics used to do it. Our fathers, our medievals, uh, St. Robert Bellarmine, you know, up up until, say, Pius X. And that's after him, that's when things started to change. They were already changing in the late 1800s, but uh, changed much more rapidly after 1943, when Pius XII gave Catholic scholars the go-ahead to at least look at historical criticism. And, but he did put danger signs around and he said, you know, just because I'm allowing it doesn't mean it's right. Uh, go in there and examine it, see what good you can take out of. Garrigou Lagrange had already taken what he could have taken that was good out of the uh, hermeneutic that liberal theologians were using for the Old Testament because uh, they were using what they call the JEPD theory, the, the Wellhausen uh, hypothesis that Genesis wasn't written by Moses, it wasn't inspired, and it was written by four different um, uh, people that came from uh, different aspects of, of, the, of life in Israel. Uh, you know, I could go through that, but I don't want to go through the details. But um, <clears throat> so we, you know, Pius XII saw, thought the same thing could be done with the New Testament. Uh, you know, take what's good out of it. And, you know, that still can be done to a certain extent, but not much, you know, really not much. Um, and and so it, they, they avoided his warnings, Pius XII's warnings, and then they went whole hog and basically ripped the New Testament apart, just like their Protestant brethren before them had done, all the liberal Protestants had done. And, you know, if you want to know one of the basic reasons, one of the major reasons why we're having all the trouble we're having today, that's it, okay? Because the Bible basically is not held up in high esteem anymore as it was in our tradition. If the Bible contains mistakes because the authors weren't inspired when they wrote his history uh, or science or math or whatever, uh, you know, we're just plainly gave you uh, a narrative, and the only thing that was true in it is what talks about save, salvation. You know, there goes 95% of the Bible. You just might as well throw the whole thing out. Okay, so um, that's the problem, and that's that lacks. I'll, I'll give you an example. Okay, so homosexuality. All right, 
Now, there's a lot of stories about the fact when we were inundated by the communists in the Catholic Church, one of the weapons they used to basically weaken the Catholic Church from inside is to introduce sexual deviance. Homosexuality was on the top of their list. Okay, that's how it came in. But how was it sanctioned by Catholic theologians? Well, here's how it was done. Um, when Paul writes about homosexuality in Romans chapter 1, and in many other places, 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 and 10, and uh, Jude talks about it, Peter talks about it, so it's all over the New Testament, uh, about half a dozen places where it condemns homosexuality. All right, what these uh, theologians, these new modernistic Catholic theologians would say is, well, you know, that's not an area of salvation, okay, homosexuality or, or sex. That's a cultural issue. You see how this can harm the Bible, all right? When we start dichotomizing the Bible and saying that only things concerning salvation are inspired and inerrant, and everything else can be in error, yeah. So you make up your own categories. One of them is uh, cultural categories, and you put sex in there. So whatever St. Paul wrote about sex, since it's not salvation, then he could have been in error. Or a nicer way to say it is that Paul just gave his opinion on this subject. And where did his opinion come from? Well, it came from the first century that he lived in. And then the, these theologians would go on to tell you that, well, uh, in that day, in the first century, uh, the moral code was a lot more strict than it is today in the 20th, 21st century, you see. And um, as writers are influenced by their culture, uh, you know, today in the 20th, 21st century, you know, they're going to write from that cultural viewpoint. And if that cultural viewpoint accepts uh, more relaxed sexual uh, uh, rules and gives more sexual freedom, well, that's just the climate of the day, and we accept that, you see. And then we can judge uh, uh, what his uh, motivation is for writing. Same with Paul. If he lived in a strict day, well, that's why he was against homosexuality, you see, you know, because he was too strict. That's what's going on today. All right. Take the issue of women. All right. What, what is a woman's role in the church today? Well, in 1 Corinthians 11 and 1 Corinthians 14, Paul makes that very clear. The woman's role is limited. It's limited to such an extent where she should, first of all, wear a veil on her head when she's praying in a congregation. Okay. Um, second, she is to be submissive to her husband. Third, she's not to speak while the assembly is going on. Okay, that's very clear in 1 Corinthians 14. Uh, so how do you, you know, we live in a modern society, though, you know. I mean, we see women speaking all the time now in church, don't we? They read the gospel. Well, don't read the gospel. Well, yes, they do. Sometimes they do. They read the epistle. Um, some more liberal churches will put them, you know, at the pulpit to read the gospel. Um, and they will certainly read the epistles, and they will uh, give the prayer of the faithful, and they will lead the songs, and they will do some other things, give the announcements, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so um, this is a, an example of exactly this, the thing Paul didn't want in the churches. Okay. And, yeah, you can say, well, it's based on their sex. Well, it is. <laughs> I mean, there's no two ways about it, okay? Uh, first, the same thing is true in First Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 to 14, when Paul says a woman is to be silent, all right? And that word silent is basically means subdued. Uh, and she's to be under the authority of her husband, and she shall be saved by childbearing. Okay, yeah, that's based on the fact that she's a female, all right? Let's not be ashamed about that. And uh, one of the reasons uh, Paul gives also is because 
It was Eve who was deceived, not Adam. All right. Uh, when she talked to the devil. So those are the repercussions for it. The first reason, however, that, T that Paul gives in Timothy is because Adam was first formed before Eve. That's in 1 Corinthians, or 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. Okay, so he has two reasons why a, a woman's role was limited in the society, in the family, and in the church today. And that is to be held for all time. Nothing changes. But how do you get rid of that if you don't like that? Well, what you do is you say that Paul, again, is speaking from his own culture, you see, from his own strict view of how the church should be run in his day. And since women speaking in church is not an issue of salvation, see, there's that key phrase again, has nothing to do with salvation per se, then we can change the rules, you see. So that's what has destroyed the church. I just gave you two examples. I could give you a dozen more. The two examples I gave were of homosexuality and the woman's role in the church and in the family. Okay. If you can set aside those New Testament rules, because when Paul gave them, he was just talking from his own culture and not what and he was not inspired by the holy spirit of god yeah well that makes sense that's the only way you could actually get rid of it you see so that's what i'm talking about when i am complaining about the catholic hermeneutic today it's really no longer catholic all right you may get bits and pieces of it in um you know uh catholic commentaries or uh, in seminaries or whatever, but that's all you're going to get, okay? It does not have the full flower at all of what we used to have. And um, anyway, I could go on and on and on about that, as you probably can guess, but um, that whole idea is of the devil, okay? Point blank, it's of the devil. And uh, until our seminaries start teaching our uh, Catholic priests or those who want to be ordained uh, the right way to look at the Bible, we're still going to have these problems. Okay. Uh, I mean, I could go on and on, you know, the Amazon sit in that we're having now basically stems from a rejection of what the Bible has taught us. Uh, let alone the tradition that's being uh, 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 swept under the rug, okay? So all these problems that we're having stem right from how we regard the Word of God. And it is my hope that this exegetical commentary I'm making, um, and I hope to get an, uh, an imprimatur for it so that it can be used in seminaries, universities, colleges everywhere because this is what catholics need they need to get back to a respect and awe, a reverence for scripture that our fathers and medievals used to have and um you know these these people that went before us if you were to tell them that well scripture is only inspired in an air when it speaks about salvation they would have laughed at you and then they would have excommunicated you okay that's not what they believed and um so you know it's it's shocking to see what has happened uh in the catholic church today so with that uh, advertisement for the book um you know please consider helping me with that or if you know anybody else that can um you know you can go to robertsongenis.org push the donation button and i would much appreciate it to help me get this into the right places it needs to be. Okay, so uh, Ben, sorry for that uh, segue there, but um, uh, you just reminded me of what uh, I wanted to advertise tonight. So Ben says, hello, Robert, can you talk some about Catholic numerology, please? I know that St. Augustine was into it. What is the symbolic meaning of frequently occurring numbers in sacred scripture, such as 3, 7, 10, 12, and 40? Did any pope councils 
did any pope or councils talk about numerology? Can you please recommend a person, book, or website for their information on Catholic numerology? Thank you very much. Okay, that's a good question, Ben. Um, I think people ought to know about this because there's a certain mystique about numerology that people have in their minds, uh, as they do with numbers in general. Because numbers, you know, we talk about um, words that are often pliable and we can make words mean different things by the context we put them in or the um, subtleties of metaphors or fig any other figure of speech and but you know numbers can be can be manipulated just as much as words can believe it or not you know initially you might think that because numbers are so exact you know seven plus five equals twelve that there's not really much you can do with numbers because you get what you put into it so to speak okay but no that's not really true i mean uh gosh i read a book a long time ago called number play i think it was written in the 70s uh, i think the, the guy's first name was giles i forget his last name anyway um i used to deal with numbers a lot believe me i know numerology backwards and forwards i know gematria uh, backwards and forwards uh, and I can tell you, uh, let me give you an example, okay? Um, let's say we use, um, you know, gematria, what it does is it tries to assign a number to each letter of the Greek and Hebrew alphabet, okay? So, um, now what some people try to do with that, like there's a guy, a Russian man, not a Catholic, he was Protestant, named Ivan Panin. P-A-N-I-N, who um, would assign the appropriate numbers to each of the, say, uh, Greek letters of the Greek New Testament, okay? And like alpha would be one, beta would be two, okay? Gamma, the third letter would be three, delta four, epsilon five, so on, so on. Okay, same with Hebrew. Okay, Aleph would be one, Beit would be two, Gimel would be three, Dalit would be four, and He would be five. So um, he would assign numbers to these letters and then see what they added up to. For example, uh, he would say all the proper names of the New Testament are divisible by seven. Okay, uh, all the places named in the New Testament are divisible by seven. All the people uh, uh, named are divisible by seven. Uh, you know, stuff like that. And he would go on and on and on in his book and say all these things are divisible by seven. <laughs> so that looks fascinating. You know, it, it really does look fascinating uh, because, wow, that means, and the number seven, as you asked in your question, is used in the Bible as the number for perfection. And this is why the apocalypse uses the number seven so often for, for the number for perfection, okay? And by the way, uh, you know, seven would be used perfect, per, for perfection, 10 would be used for completeness, 12 would be used for fullness, 40 would be used for testing, three would be used for uh, the Trinity, uh, you know, things like that. That's how these things are symbolized. But anyway, so Pannon is, you know, trying to find out how many things in the Bible are divisible by seven. Okay. On the surface, it looks fascinating, you know, and if you're a novice into the Bible and uh, you, you want to find how the Bible is above all their books, you know, above Shakespeare and Homer and, and you know, whatever other book was written, you know, the infinite mind of God can only, you know, write uh, words that can be uh, numericalized to, to be divisible by seven in, you know, 
dozens and dozens of places in the Bible. And um, yeah, it sounds real good, but it doesn't, and pun unintended, it doesn't pan out. Okay, the guy's name is Pannon, P-A-N-I-N. It doesn't pan out. Why is that? Well, the reason it doesn't pan out is because, you know, almost every paragraph in the New Testament has a textual variant. There's only one paragraph in the New Testament that I know of that does not have a textual variant, and that's Luke chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Okay, and that itself is unusual. Okay, so and if you and let's so let's say because that's doesn't have any textual variants. Now, what do I mean by a textual variant? A textual variant is a different reading of a letter or a word or even a sentence in another Greek manuscript. Okay, and you know. They're, they're not, all, you know, we're not, we're not inundated with these things, but there are, you know, in every paragraph, there, it could be just a letter, but that's still a textual variant. And if it's, this, if it's a different letter, what's going to happen? You're going to have a different number attached to that if you're going to use gematria. Okay, so uh, the, only, the only paragraph, as I said, without textual variants is Luke chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, every other one does. So how is Ivan Panin possibly going to get the right text, okay, if if he thinks that the number 7 is so important and that this proves that it's the Word of God because all these things are divisible by 7, how is he possibly going to determine what the right textual variant is that he can use? to start his gematria and end up with things divisible by seven. It's impossible. Can't do it. Okay? I mean, if there's if there was only one variant in a paragraph, yeah, you might possibly figure out what the correct reading is because you just replace that letter with a letter that will allow the whole paragraph to add up to something divisible by seven. Theoretically, that's possible. But if you have more than one variant, if you have two, three, four, five variants, even small ones, there's no way that you can take, you know, five variables and try to figure out what, you know, the one is that's going to work that's divisible by seven. You know, this is not math where it's like a quadratic equation. You know, this is, you know, a guessing game that you would have to engage in to figure out what letter is the right one to use. Okay. so. You know, um, numer uh, numerology, um, uh, or gematria, gematria at least, is not something you want to get into, okay? And I've had some people show me some fascinating things that they've done with gematria. But you know what? Um, if you ever get the chance, take statistics. I went to college. I took statistics. And you can see that statistics can lie to you just as much as they can tell you the truth. And that's basically what happens with gematria. You can make statistics say anything you want, basically, if you get the right one that you want to work with. All right. So, so I'm saying numbers can be very, very deceiving. And so I'm always cautious about anybody who's, who gets into numerology and uh, gematria for that reason. I've seen a lot of people get hurt by it. Okay. And a lot of people get disillusioned because you know, the Bible isn't the perfect, you know, numerical system that they thought it was. And, you know, you, you, yeah, so it's it's not worth the heartache, believe me. Now, as far as, you know, our Alexandrian fathers, Augustine, you know, Ambrose and the like, they were into, you know, they were into a lot of allegory. And that's why they were into numerology. All right. Um, but because of the variations you can get with both allegorical interpretation and numerology, the church never picked up on this, okay? The church never made any dogmas, any teaching, um, official teaching on, you know, how to use numerology or, 
you know, or gematria or whatever. It just never did. Okay. Allegory, you know, it's fine in itself if it brings you closer to God, let's say, and and you see in the Old Testament a type of Jesus and Joseph and and then you see what Joseph went through and and all that. You know, type, anti-type. That's okay. But a lot of the fathers went beyond that, you know, started allegorizing with philosophical ideas mm -hmm. and um uh, especially when the Book of Wisdom talks about wisdom. Boy, you should see what they've done with that. Uh, and Origen was the most guilty of this. You know, not only did he allegorize basically anything he came in contact with, and uh, that would be dangerous, okay? Uh, it's dangerous in the sense that, uh, let's put it this way, if you stay on track with the redemptive message of the Bible at large, and your allegory fits into that those parameters okay you know there's nothing wrong with it um it, you know if if it if it's used as a pedagogical device to teach people about the gospel allegories are great in that sense you know let's take you know samson uh let's say he was a type of christ and so you go through his you go through his narrative and you see he killed a lion and with the jawbone of an ass. And uh, after he killed the lion, he went back into it to find um, bees and honey. Okay. Well, here, you can make a nice allegory out of that. Samson's a type of Christ. Okay. Uh, he kills the, the, the lion who, in this instance, represents the devil because, you know, 1 Peter 5, 8 says, the devil roams as a roaring lion, and then he comes back after he kills the lion, and he finds bees and honey. And what's honey in the in, in the in the Psalms? Honey is a a symbol of the gospel. You see, so you could say allegorically that after Christ kills the uh, defeats Satan at the cross, the gospel comes forth in the form of honey, so to speak, and you know. And, and voila, you have a gospel story, okay? Uh, you can do that, you know, and not saying that it's right, okay, because the Bible nowhere gives that kind of an interpretation, all right? But it may be used pedagog pedagogically to educate your children. Who knows? You know, they kind of like that stuff. It might be better than watching... Um, uh, you know, Batman or Superman or things like that. Let's put it that way, okay? Uh, or uh, I forget, what's that? A.K. Rowling, what, what was it? Her thing, she made a billion dollars off of it. I, I, the name slips me right now. But, you know, it's better than, better than reading the witchcraft and the sorcery in that book, okay? So, uh, you know, that can be good. But, see, the danger with allegory is that it can – it, it can then, um, the temptation is to get away from the strictures of the redemptive message and you start allegorizing all kinds of things in the Bible that aren't related to salvation. And, you know, and, and, you, and you get off on all these philosophical tangents that may or may not be true. Okay. And that's what Origen did. So, and uh, a lot of these Alexandrian fathers were into that. And after a while, it subsided because everybody found out, well, look, you know what? Why do you have to mess with allegories? Let's just read the Bible for the Bible, read it for what it says, and, you know, live by it. That's all you really got to do. And, um, you know, eventually they found that out. And, it, you know, the, the allegorical interpretation, you know, subsided, not totally, but it subsided to a large degree. The Antiochian fathers, on the other hand, were strictly literal. And uh, that's just the type of hermeneutic they had. So they were button heads against the Alexandrian fathers, you know, who was going to get the most interpretations and, um, you know, Chrysostom and, uh, the uh, Gregory Nazianzus and Gregory Nyssa and all those. Um, but, you know, the exception in the Alexandrian school is Jerome. I don't think Jerome had one allegorical interpretation in his whole life, which was good. Okay, so um, now numerology 
as far as um, historical narratives, um, it's not good to get into. Okay, but when we're talking about prophecy, that's a whole different ball game. Okay, it's a whole different ball game from the time of Daniel, uh, who uses numbers quite a lot, and uh, um, Zechariah a little bit. Okay, and of course, the apocalypse. Okay, um, I think it uses the number seven. 49 times. By the way, that's seven times seven. <laughs> Just thought I'd mention that. Um, and in my commentary on the apocalypse, I show all the numbers that are used, and there's about 12 different numbers that are used, and I show the frequency of the numbers. But seven has the most. Um, 10 is another number that's used frequently. 12 is another number. Four is another number, okay? And then you'll find these numbers in multiples, like, you know, the 144,000, which is 12 times 12,000, okay? Or, you know, you'll find at the end uh, the 12 foundations upon which the new temple comes down. Okay, normally we only have one foundation, but here we have 12 foundations named after the 12 apostles, okay? So all those numbers, and John tells us that basically in the beginning of the book. He says, look, I'm going to be using numbers here. In so many words, he tells us this, and they're all going to be symbolic. And how do we know that? Well, because right in the first chapter, he talks about the seven candlesticks and the seven spirits of God. And, you know, so we know right away that, Wow, this is a different look, okay? This is not Paul's epistle to the Romans. And, and he continues to use uh, symbolic numbers throughout the book. So once we know that, okay, once we know the context of what he's writing, prophetic writing, then every rule that I gave you about numbers changes because now, we are basically told to go in and look at the symbol symbolism represented by these numbers, okay? And, you know, so that's an art in itself, is deciphering the meaning meant by each number, and sometimes there's different numbers used in the same context, Okay, and figuring them out. And I spent a lot of time doing that in my commentary on the apocalypse. Um, um, I don't have a copy of it here to hold up, but uh, it is available in robertsongenis.org if you want to know about how numerology fits into prophecy. I also co cover some of the numbers in Daniel as well. Okay. You know, Daniel has this thing in chapter 9, the 70 weeks. It's called the 70 weeks of Daniel. And so, and you know, you have to figure out when it starts, when it ends. And then he divides the 70 weeks into 62 weeks, you know, and then seven weeks, and then there's an extra week. Okay, so, you know, and then he tells us there that the week refers to years. So, you know, he's setting us up. You know, he, God wants us to go in there and look at these numbers and figure them out, all right? Uh, so your, your whole interpretation of the apocalypse and Daniel are going to center around knowing this, the symbolism behind these numbers, okay? And uh, that's very important. Otherwise, you're really not going to know what, what uh, John is saying, okay? You know, and I often, uh, um, when I'm trying to teach people how to understand the apocalypse, what I'll say, it's, it's like when you have a dream, okay? Each of us, when we go to sleep at night, invariably, unless we're some kind of, you know, I don't know, it, it, normally human beings will dream. I don't know. I have, I have never heard an exception to that. They dream, and what do they dream? 
how are their dreams formed? What are they dreaming about? Well, you know, we might dream of events that happened during the day or could be 10 years ago. Somehow they pop up in our mind <laughs> without warning, you know, or could be more than that, 20 years, 30 years ago. But we're going to dream, but how do we dream about them? Well, we dream about them in symbols, basically. Now, that's fascinating to, to uh, contemplate. Because let's say you dream about um, uh, a horde of people are carrying you and you don't want to be carried and you're fighting and fighting them and they get to the precipice of the cliff and they, and they throw you off the cliff and you're falling and falling and falling and before you reach the ground, what's going to happen? You're going to wake up, okay? That's the way our dreams work. They won't let us die. Uh, we can live another day in our dream because no matter how precarious it is, how dangerous, we're not going to die. Okay. Um, we may get hurt or whatever, but we're not going to die. So, but how would you interpret that dream? Well, you know, let's say that day you got fired from work. Your boss came in with a bunch of his colleagues and said, we've examined your work and we found out you're not working correctly you've been fluffing off all this time and so you're fired and in the midst of all these you pick up your stuff you walk out and your job is over you come home depressed blah 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 uh and you're worried about that because you don't have a job now what am i going to do without a job to support my family and so you're dreaming about this and the, the way the dream is symbolizes itself is that you have a bunch of these people carrying you and throwing you off the cliff. You see, that's how we dream. So the, basically the throwing off the, of the cliff is symbolic of you getting fired and, and being cast into oblivion, so to speak, and not knowing what's going to happen to you. Okay. Uh, that's the way John writes the book of the apocalypse. Okay. Not all the time, but about 80% of the time, he writes it that way in symbolic language. So as in your dream, these symbols all mean something. And he's trying to draw a picture for you uh, so that you can put it all together in a puzzle, so to speak, and figure out, that's it. I see what he's doing. So now the Bible will help you. Historical events will help you. Uh, your own intuition will help you put all these things together, but that's why he wrote it that way. Now, somebody will ask, well, you know, why bother? Why bother writing the apocalypse that way? Can't you just write it in simple language so everybody can understand? Good question. <laughs> okay. You know, the Jesus was posed with the same question also. And somebody said to him, why do you talk in parables? Because the parable is very similar to the apocalypse, okay? It's symbolic language. And then you have to apply it to real-life events, all right? So Jesus said, you know, what, what was Jesus' answer? You're going to be astounded by this. Yes. I speak in parables so that they don't know the truth. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, that's half of it, actually. The other half is, I speak in parables to those who know the kingdom of God so they can be taught even more about the kingdom. He's talking about his apostles. But even they didn't get it. You know, they say, well, Jesus, you know, can't figure this out. Can you explain it? So he would go and explain what the parable meant. Okay. But to those who weren't with him, the Jews of the day who remained in their unbelief, because very few of them, you know, would accept Jesus. He said, I talk in parables so that they don't understand the truth. Okay. So that they can hear without hearing and see without seeing, as Isaiah recorded them long ago, because they're not interested in the gospel. They're interested in what Jesus can give them free food, free healings, you know, all that kind of stuff. And that's all they want. They have no con conception of him being the son of God and, you know, going to the cross for their sins. They, you know, their whole understanding of life is what is limited to this earth. So, but the point is, why did he talk in parables? To hide truth 
and to reveal truth, interestingly enough, like two-sided coin. Same thing with the apocalypse. For those who are in the know, so to speak, those who fo are following the kingdom, they know how to look at these symbols and interpret them correctly, okay? Those that don't, you know, they'll see the four horsemen of the apocalypse and Apocalypse chapter 6 and say, well, you know, that refers to the Beatles, as we used to get from uh, some high-flying interpreters in the 1960s, <laughs> Thing, things like that, okay? So, um, you, know, stay, you know, those are not <laughs> kosher, obviously, okay? But you see how lost they can be by a misinterpretation of the symbols of the apocalypse, okay? So, um, wow. Gosh, I did it again. We've got seven minutes left. I've gone on and on about this. But, you know, that was an important question. I think I've answered all your questions here. Um, stay away from the websites that deal with numerology, Ben, uh, or Gamatria. Not something you want to get into. Believe me, I know from experience, okay? I have about 25 years or more of experience in that and uh, not worth the time believe me okay uh, Lauren says can you explain outside of the church there is absolutely no salvation relating to the Phineites and their rejection of baptism of blood and desire uh, yeah the Phineites are wrong okay they go to the extreme and not that going to the extreme is wrong in itself but the exegesis that Father Feeney used of the Bible to get to the position is categoric, categorically wrong, okay? What they try to do is make a dichotomy between justification and salvation. Now, on the one hand, you know, we do make distinctions along the line that they want to get to, which is the reason they say there's a difference between justification and salvation. And why this is important is because they say that baptism of uh, water uh, only justifies you, it doesn't save you, okay? That's why this issue is important. Only justifies you, doesn't save you. So what they're saying is that justification does not save you. So every time the Bible talks about Abraham being justified, David being justified, like in Romans 4, for the Phineite, they're not saved. They don't have salvation. And the reason they would say that is because, well, Abraham has to last until the end, and only at the end will he be saved. Well, yes, of course, but it doesn't mean he's not saved at a certain point of time before he dies or before the general judgment, okay? Because let's say if he were to die and he was justified, then he would go to heaven if he died on that particular day, all right? Um, and his, as a matter of fact, you know, we, we have souls in heaven. We know that for a fact. We have saints in heaven. How could they be in heaven if they're not saved? They've died before the general judgment. Okay. So that's where he goes off the track, pure and simple. If you really want to get to the core of his belief, that's where he made his mistake. Okay. And because the Council of Trent, chapter 4, in session six says um, that the labor of regeneration justifies. Uh, well, you know, that's, that's where Feeney went off. He took the word justification as not meaning salvation. And so baptism doesn't save, it just justifies. Okay. So that's wrong. All right. No father, no medieval, no church uh, official statement has ever said that justification is not salvation. Okay, they said just the opposite. And, um, you know, I've challenged the, uh, some of the Fenier brothers on this, and they look at you like, you know, you're, you're cross-eyed. Uh, they just don't get it. Okay, and that's, been, and that's the problem with the Fenier interpretation is, you know, once a man of his stature comes out and says it, and he led the whole group up there in the Northeast, and... You know, they're going to take whatever he said as gospel. And a lot of them don't have the acumen to be able to decipher what he said and where he made his mistakes. And sometimes, even if they're told, they don't 
accept it or want to accept it because you know there goes the whole movement if you find one flaw you know you pull the card out from the deck of cards that you've built what's going to happen to that deck of cards is going to fall flat on its face and here's one card that if you pull it out the so-called difference between justification and salvation the whole thing comes down okay so <clears throat> that's why that can be very dangerous all right we got a few minutes here all right um let's hold on while i scroll here okay let me deal with someone at the end here because i don't want to go through the same thing okay kevin says why would god send anyone a delusion as expressed in second thessalonians chapter 2 verse 11. it says for this reason god sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie <laughs> good question kevin uh we covered this a little bit last time or the time before and uh, it's good to keep going over it because it's one of those deeper truths of Christianity that when you first hear it it's like wow what kind of God is this you know I mean if you take that statement at face value that Paul says in 2nd Thessalonians chapter 2 and that's the passage by the way is talking about the man of sin or man of iniquity that Paul says will come before the end comes and he has all powers of, of signs and wonders and miracles to deceive people okay and then in the, the, the last verse of that little pericope there it says and God uh, sends them powerful delusions so that they believe the lie all right, so how did God do that? Well, it just says it in the previous verses. It says, Satan comes with all power and signs and lying wonders. Okay, so that's how God's doing it. He's allowing Satan to come out there with the power, power of miracles to deceive the people. So he's using Satan to do it. Okay. This is Satan's time. Now, this is the time that Apocalypse, you know, we just talked about the Apocalypse. Let's go back there. The Apocalypse in chapter 20, verses 1 to 3, talks about Satan being bound in the abyss and a chain put on him. The angel came down and put the chain on him, and he, he, he put a seal on it that he could not deceive the nations for a thousand years now there's your number thousand talk about symbolic numbers okay and that number is used six times in that chapter all right so you better know what it means and if you don't know what it means then you're never going to understand the apocalypse uh, I, I have to go off on a tangent here <laughs> chapter 20 is the most important book or chapter in the apocalypse okay and that is because any interpretation that you give to the apocalypse must first go through chapter 20 and that is because it has a thousand years between the time that satan is bound and the time that he's loosed and this the end of the world so the question is where does that 1000 years fit all right and there's basically three options that you have. I'm not going to go through them right now. Maybe we can do that on tomorrow's program. There's three options as to where you put that thousand years. Okay. The one the Catholic Church has accepted, as I said before, was stated not real clearly, but you know, enough information at the Council of Ephesus when it said that Satan was bound at the cross, at the cross of Jesus. So that means a thousand years starts then, not in the Old Testament, not in the future, at the cross. And that's because Satan is bound. And Apocalypse 20, verse 1 to 3 says he's bound at that time. 
and so do a lot of other New Testament passages like John 12, 31, John 16, 11, Hebrews 2, 14, 2 Peter 2, 4, Jude 6, uh, Luke 10, 18. You know, there's about a dozen of them that all tell us that Satan was bound at the cross. So that's where the thousand years begins, okay? And he is not going to be able to deceive the nations, at least like he did before the Old Testament during this time. And this time is basically the time from uh, the first coming of Christ till the second coming. Obviously, that's not a thousand years, literally, is it? Okay. So the year again, you have a symbolic number. Why is the number 1,000 years? Because it's 10 times 100. 10 is the completeness. 100 is even more completeness. So 1,000 is even, this is it, the final completeness, so to speak. And this is when Jesus comes back. Uh, but Apocalypse 1 to 3, uh, 20 verses 1 to 3 says that Satan will be loosed for a little season. Okay, just before Christ comes back. And that's what 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 11 is talking about. That little season that Satan comes back to do what? Well, we just read in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 9, that he comes with all power and signs and lying wonders to deceive people. And what is uh, chapter 20? And the Apocalypse, verse 7 and 8, say, well, he, he's released to the uttermost parts of the earth, Gog and Magog, to, to go out and deceive the nations. Okay? So, the very opposite now. Okay? So, before, when he was bound at the beginning of the thousand years, he is not able to deceive the nations in the same fashion that he was in the Old Testament. Now, the gospel can go out. You see, if Satan was given total power over the world to deceive the nations, then the gospel could never go out. And people could never be saved. But the gospel has gone out. I mean, the church basically ruled the world in the Middle Ages after the fall of the Roman Empire. And it hasn't been until modern times where the church's power is, you know, decreasing, you know, century by century until we can hardly hold on anymore, all right? And so maybe now is the time that Satan is being loosed to go out and deceive the nations again, because that's what's prophesied of him. And how's he going to do that? Well, Second Thessalonians 2 verse 9 says, with all power and signs and lying wonders. So whoever this man of sin is, he's going to be a miracle worker. And only the strongest are going to survive and not succumb to the power that this man will have, whatever he has. It's going to be intense. Okay. And the whole world is going to look at him and say, well, here's our answer. This guy can do miracles. And, and you know what? What you just read was that God's the one who's allowing it to happen. All right. He's the one that's allowing the delusion to take place by allowing Satan to do his work. This has been prophesied for ever since the world began, basically, okay, that this day would come. And Jesus said, you know, it's going to be so severe, and he says there are going to be false Christs and false prophets doing signs and wonders in Matthew 24, verse 21 to 24. Okay, so there you have the miracles again. In the rest of the apocalypse, you know, Apocalypse 16, verse 15, again, talk about miracles that are being done. Okay, so, you know, we know something terrible is, is going to take place, but again, God's allowing it. Why? What kind of God is this that would allow people to be deceived? Well, it's the same God that we talked about in Romans chapter 1, you know. Uh, he talked, uh, St. Paul there talks about lesbianism and homosexuality, and they persist in this. Why? Because it says three times in that chapter, God gave them over to the lust of their flesh. God gave them over to it. He took the active role in giving them over 
In other words, basically what it's saying is God withdrew his grace because it's great. His grace is what is the only thing that keeps us from going down the path of sin, his grace. And that's why as Catholics, we do everything we can to get the grace of God, whether it's dipping your hand in the holy water and blessing yourself or going to the Eucharist. All those things give you the grace of God so that you don't go, go down that path of sin. Okay, But if God withdraws his grace, then you, you go down that path of sin exponentially, you see, and you end up in the devious lifestyle that those people ended up, and that's still happening today. So what does this tell us about God? He's a dynamic God, dynamic. He's not neutral when it comes to sin. If you want to sin and continue to disobey him, turn your back against him and spit in his face of all the things that he's given you, God will help you go down that way. Okay? He's not going to remain neutral and watch you sin and, and just hope that things get better. Now, you reach a point where God withdraws from you and you go the natural course of what a sinful soul will do. Okay? And you can read about this plenty of times in the Old Testament. Go read the Old Testament. Go read those narratives. Find out what God we're talking about here, because it's the same God that exists today. No different. Okay? Yeah, he was no pansy. He was no milk toast. Okay? If you sinned, and you did it deliberately, and without repentance, God help you. Uh, he would take an active role in not only watching you down the path of sin, but in your final judgment as well. Okay. Uh, I mean, I could tell you story after story in the Old Testament that just illustrates this idea. Uh, but that's the answer to your question, Kevin, is we have a dynamic God who does not stand by when we deliberately disbelieve and deliberately turn our back on him. Okay. He will take an active role in, uh, hardening us in our sin and uh, basically that's what's going to happen that's that the world this world is headed for a very sad time you know you would think that hopefully at the end there would be some reprieve after all the misery we've gone through you know uh, for you know six or seven thousand years uh but it's going to get worse until the very end now the, the fortunate thing is it's only going to be, as the apocalypse says, for a little season. Now, a little ambiguous, okay, what's a little season? All right, uh, at least we know it's not the symbolic thousand years. All right, it's, it's going to be something a lot less than that. And I give <clears throat> some, um, <clears throat> excuse me, educated guesses as to what the little season may be. <clears throat> in um, my commentary but uh, so it won't last forever and <clears throat> while wow, my voice is going and Jesus said if God had not shortened the time then not even the elect would survive okay so <clears throat> it has to be this way but it will be shortened for the appropriate time as God sees fit all right, so um, I'm sorry we've gone 10 minutes over time. Those of you who uh, haven't had your question answered, um, I will try to uh, bring them back tomorrow, and I'll be glad to answer them. And until then, we'll see you again. May God bless you, keep you, and may you find out what kind of God we really have, and may you draw closer to him. God bless you. Bye-bye.